uh, which is a very timely one, is how the U.S. military uh, can leverage commercial space capabilities or improve the way it's leveraging commercial space capabilities in the future. Uh, and so I've asked each of the panelists to prepare some opening remarks of about five minutes each. So I'm going to go down the line uh, introducing uh, each of them. Uh, and, uh, and letting them have their opening remarks. And then after that, uh, I'm going to ask a few follow-up questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience here uh, for your questions you may have for them. So I'm going to start. Uh, to my left here is Doug Lavero. He's a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. Uh, so he has been right at the middle uh, of this uh, for many years now. Uh, and so, Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks uh, very much, Todd, and I apologize for being a little bit hoarse uh, today. I'm, uh, I am nursing a cold, which I'm hoping to give to both Todd and to Scott uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that uh, they can uh, share my pain. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks uh, very much for everybody for being here, and I want to thank Todd for, for bringing this uh, together. Uh, I don't think there's, um, that there are that uh, many, uh, many surprises that you'll hear from me today, but more, um, more a... Uh, a re-enunciation of the things that I think that we um, have been talking about, quite frankly, for the last several years and are now starting to do, which is the good part, is that we're starting to do them. Uh, let me start off with uh, talking about some of the challenges that we uh, face and why these challenges are um, fundamental to, uh, to what we need to do uh, between the military and the commercial world. The challenges we face are, are pretty um, understandable. Uh, there are people who want to take space capabilities away from the U.S. And we don't worry about that just because they take the space capabilities away, but they take, but they take away the leverage that we get from the space capabilities. And many of you have seen that in action during your lifetimes as uh, war has transitioned uh, from, a, uh, from a, a war that was constrained to a, a, an AOR to ones that are worldwide and fought on a global basis. Uh, clearly, when you have uh, people going ahead and doing targeting halfway around the world from places in, uh, in Las Vegas or in Nevada, um, you can understand how space plays into even the lowest level of combat, um, going ahead and taking out individual targets versus uh, going ahead and organizing an entire campaign. So space is fundamental to everything we do in conventional war, everything we do in, uh, in nuclear war as well. Space is fundamental to that. Uh, as well. And so we, we have come to depend upon our space capabilities like no others. You all know that. You've heard us say this a thousand times, and you've heard us say that people are trying to take that away from us. Uh, uh, DNI Clapper has uh, testified in, con in front of Congress on the things that people are trying to do. So we have to figure out a way to make that not happen. Um, we could go ahead, as some people had suggested previously, try to figure out how to fight wars without space, but quite frankly, that is not an attractive notion. That doesn't mean that we should not practice what happens when you lose space for a short time during a battle. But to fight war the way that the U.S. wants to fight war without space is really anathema to us uh, because it means that our, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our seamen are being put at risk. Uh, and we don't want them to be put at risk. We want them to go ahead and have the best advantage um, that they can have. And space gives them that advantage. So we have to figure out how do we maintain that advantage? We could try to do it by building more resilient um, and more numerous space systems all by ourselves by the U.S. government. Uh, that's neither fiscally um, respons responsible nor, quite frankly, operationally responsible because if you do that, they tend to all have the same built-in vulnerabilities. Uh, if you go ahead and try to figure out how to bring a diverse set of space capabilities together, um, that is a much more resilient kind of capability to have because everyone has different weak points, everyone has different vulnerabilities, everyone has different advantages to be used in different ways, and quite frankly, they bring with them a, a sense of a, a different kind of political dynamic as well as a different kind of resilience dynamic to an equation. So we really want to figure out how to ingest these uh, commercial space capabilities into an overall architecture. Uh, clearly, we have been doing this for years already, in the commercial satellite communication regime. In satellite communications, over 80% of satellite communications that we use in combat today are commercial satellite communications. But that's not being used from, that's not being viewed from a resilience standpoint or a surety standpoint. That's being done from a pure um, throughput standpoint. We just don't have enough capability to go ahead and do that on military satellite communication. 
But if we really want that to be an operationally resilient capability, we not only need to go ahead and use those kind of capabilities, but we need to figure out how to integrate them into true war planning, into true operational responsiveness, in the true network operations so that we could easily fail from one communication network to another. Similarly, in remote sensing, we see a great birth of remote sensing capabilities um, in, the na in the nation, and we buy those, it, those uh, image robust, resilient, war fighting, uh, war fighting framework, you have to go ahead and do more than just buy images. You have to figure out how to go ahead and task them cooperatively. You have to figure out how to process them simultaneously. You have to figure out how to fuse the information together from many different sources. So we're not just talking about leveraging these, these commercial services. We're talking about integrating these commercial um, services. And it's not just communications and remote sensing, although those are the predominant ones that we see today. Uh, we definitely see a, a big rise in um, space situational awareness from a commercial perspective, and those capabilities go ahead and complement and, in fact, add to the kind of capabilities that we have in the government today. And again, not just the sensors, but the ability to fuse that information in new ways and new manners that we would not necessarily think of in a monolithic government-sponsored uh, arrangement. So we get from the commercial world a, a diversity of capability, a diversity of vulnerability, a diversity of use cases, and a diversity, quite frankly, of a way of, a, of supplying that capability rather than you would get from a simple monolithic government approach to a problem, which is typically what we've had in space today. Uh, we think that if we do that, and if we do that well, we can go ahead and create far more resilient space capabilities for the warfighter than we have today. Some people ask me, well, Doug, couldn't an adversary do the same thing? Uh, and I typically answer, not easily. And the reason is because is almost all these commercial space capabilities, in fact, the new entrepreneurial space capabilities are almost entirely U.S. born. Uh, we want to keep it that way. We want those people to stay in the U.S. and that leads to how do we as the government go ahead and enable um, us to go ahead and get more and more commercial satellite services, commercial space services, it's not just the satellite. Uh, and that means we have to go ahead and change policies in, with regard to licensing to make it easier for people to go ahead and invest in advanced space capabilities uh, within the U.S. Because that frees up the entrepreneurial spirit that we see in the U.S. and it would allow those new space services to come to the, the market more quickly, more rapidly, more agilely. Uh, we see one of the most agile um, uh, sectors of the market right now on, in, in space servicing missions. That is a capability that the U.S. government would, har would almost never develop, and even if we did, it would be a DARPA project that would end after one year and we wouldn't fund it. Um, as opposed to if it's done commercially and it comes forward and we can create the right licensing structure for it, it now becomes a self-supporting capability uh, that we then can go ahead and utilize for government usage. So we have to go ahead and figure out a way to integrate these capabilities, not just leverage them. We have to figure out a way to go ahead and put the policies in place uh, to attract them. And we have to figure out a way to go ahead and work, uh, work with them as they advance, as they evolve uh, moving forward. Uh, these, are the, these are the things that we want to do as a government um, in encouraging the commercial space uh, world to move forward. It's the kind of things we need to make sure that space services are always available to our warfighters that can't be taken away um, because there are too many sources with too many different uh, strong points versus weak points, uh, and we can assure our, our soldiers and sailors the use of space capabilities well into a conflict. Let me stop there, and we'll uh, do more in the question and answer. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, and so next up uh, is Scott Pace, uh, who is the director of the Space Policy Institute and a professor at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. And so uh, while Doug was able to give us a military perspective, I've asked Scott on the panel uh, to give us uh, a broader uh, policy perspective. Scott. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess one of the first things I would say is uh, why would a professor of international affairs uh, despite being a longtime space cadet, why would he talk about, you know, this, this issue? Uh, and I think one of them is that some of the most interesting problems in international affairs these days are those that are beyond areas of traditional sovereignty. Uh, so things like uh, events on the high seas, the air above the high seas, 
uh, cyberspace, outer space, Arctic regions, Antarctica, so forth. All these areas where we have shared interactions with other countries, um, but where no one is necessarily claiming sovereignty over those areas. And we are faced by uh, a number of pressures uh, against the rules-based international order that we've tried to build uh, since World War II, uh, and the institutions that the U.S. Uh, helped create. Uh, and these pressures are coming, uh, in some cases, from state actors uh, who are looking to practice tra traditional spheres of influence uh, that don't uh, look at uh, some of the rules that, uh, that we've tried to promote. Others, uh, the particular case of something like ISIS is really a throwback to a, really, a sorry for the academic term, a pre-Westphalian uh, form of, of government where we're not even a nation state, uh, but we're trying to do uh, sort of something else. Uh, and so the way we behave in places like outer space also reflects how we behave or and think others are going to behave in other shared areas. So for example, uh, Russian behavior in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe, Chinese behavior in the South China Sea uh, should give us pause about the degree to which we can rely upon them uh, to follow other areas uh, of international order. Uh, there's a thing in the political science world that uh, we talk about signaling. Um, and in the case of immediate aftermath of World War II, uh, much to our somewhat resistance, uh, we had to accept the signals that Stalin was sending us about what he was going to be doing. Uh, in the early days of the uh, thawing of the Cold War, there was some skepticism of Gorbachev, but we took the signals that he was sending and absorbed them and, try and found ways to say, oh, their intentions have really changed because they've take undertaken some costly steps. Uh, today, uh, again, facing some resistance uh, because, you know, we like to think that the world is reasonable and, you know, Americans can work everything out. Uh, the signals we are seeing uh, from Russia and to a lesser extent, but also from China, are ones that say they don't buy into uh, some of the assumptions that we've had over the last decades. Uh, so the world is becoming a more dangerous place and therefore how we behave in space and how we behave in other international regimes is a, a cause for concern. Um, if you look at uh, space areas, there's a tendency to think in terms of particular stovepipes. So this is what NASA is doing. This is what DOD is doing. A State Department is going around and giving a speech. Uh, there's this cool launch that a private company is going off and doing. And so there's not a tendency to look at space activities the way, say, the Chinese might look at it in terms of a wonderful phrase, uh, comprehensive national strength. The U.S. has quite impressive comprehensive national strength but we often don't really act that way, uh, and we don't treat it uh, in a more integrative uh, way uh, to advance our interests. And in part, that's the space community's own fault, because the space community, you know, the usual answer is uh, human spaceflight, what was the question? Uh, as opposed to human spaceflight and exploration as an answer to a question. And so one of the things I, I try to say, certainly with students, um, is that space policy is a derivative policy, that it comes out of U.S. economic and national security and to some extent moral uh, imperatives that uh, what we try to accomplish in space derives from other underlying interests and we use space to advance uh, those interests. So you have to look at where are our geopolitical interests these days, where are our economic interests these days, uh, where are our symbolic interests uh, that we, we want to, to model. Um, and I think that uh, if you want to be optimistic, the glass is half full. We have some great assets uh, and some great people thinking about them. Uh, the glass is half empty in the sense that we haven't really been able to bring that together. Um, in particular, uh, if you look on the civil space side, the uh, lack of a clear path after the end of the space station program is, is a very, very serious threat, not simply because uh, gee, uh, space enthusiasts are wondering where they're going to go and what the commercial markets are going to be, but because we have an international partnership. It's not just a U.S. partnership. It's an international partnership with our closest friends and allies, and we're not able to really say what comes next. And you all know how long space programs take, so if we're not planning exactly on what's coming next, what you're really planning on doing is going out of business. Uh, the Chinese are certainly commenting on this. They note that uh, the space station will come to an end in 2024. They will have their station up, up around then. They're open to international partnership. And to some extent, that's fine. I don't mind the Chinese being in space, as many of you heard me say. I do mind them being, them being up there without me. Because space is not simply something where we send uh, our machines uh, or where we send people for photo opportunities. It's also a reflection of what we value. If the U.S. is the most space-reliant country in the world, 
uh, our security, our economy, or even our own self-image to some extent depend on this. Yet we don't treat it uh, quite that way. Um, and we are looking at a world where as space becomes more important and mention about norms of behavior and so forth, well, who's going to write the rules for those norms? Who is going to shape that international order in this regime beyond that of traditional sovereignty? The rules are made by the people who show up, not by the people who stay behind. And so if we are not partnering with other people and shaping those rules, we are staying behind. Uh, many of you know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a critic of much of this administration's uh, human space exploration policy. Um, I want to make clear that I think that the current national space policy is actually quite good, and I would hope that we don't see a dramatic uh, change in it uh, the way we saw in, in 2010. However, if I could surgically change one thing about that policy, it would be about human space exploration. Not merely because, you know, I'm a, a moon enthusiast, again, as some of you know, may know, but because the uh, current approach doesn't really provide a lot of opportunities for partnerships uh, with the commercial sector or with international partners as much as we would like. And therefore, it lessens our ability to shape and mold the direction of the space environment as we might like. In many ways, it is an old-fashioned space policy, which is looking at what can the U.S. do by itself, whereas leadership today is about what can we get others to do with us. And in order to get people to do things with us, we need to have goals and objectives, whether they be economic, civil exploration, military, that they can partner with us on. And so uh, I look forward to a discussion not only of how can the commercial sector work and support with the military, but how international partnerships with our security and economic interests can help shape uh, a global uh, rules-based order that we actually would want to live in, rather than the one I think we're heading toward. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and then now uh, we'll shift. Our last three panelists uh, are all industry uh, related. And so uh, we'll start next uh, with Don Harms, who is the Vice President uh, of Global Sales and Marketing at Boeing Satellite Systems International. And among her many responsibilities, uh, she does strategic planning for commercial satellite programs. And so, uh, Don, uh, if you could give us uh, briefly a perspective uh, from uh, the Boeing civil space side, uh, commercial space side, excuse me, uh, and in particular looking at, you know, you're, you're one of the representatives here on the panel who actually build satellites. Um, so, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dawn. Yes, thank you. So, Boeing has been in the commercial satellite uh, business for more than 50 years, beginning with uh, SYNCOM, the first geosynchronous satellite that was launched in 1963. Uh, since then, we've built 170 commercial satellites for 50 different customers, 20 different nations, and it's a very global business. Um, we've also, um, as you know, built many numerous um, government uh, satellites for NOAA, NASA, and military uh, customers. So what are those technologies that uh, we might be able to leverage from the commercial sector to the, the government sector? I think there are many, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of technology development, and maybe you can help uh, find that common ground where we can leverage. So uh, one of the most uh, uh, requested requirements from our, our commercial customers as we go through a very um, a, a period of strong innovative uh, changes like we've never seen before in the 20, 25 years I've been in business is uh, flexibility on orbit. And what does that mean? So everybody wants to f future proof their business plans. And any asset that's going to be up in space for 15 years, they want technologies that can kind of morph as business plans change, as uh, requirements change, and, uh, and what does that mean for a manufacturer. So what we've done and what we have been doing over many years is developing uh, digital requirements, uh, digital uh, technology. So the digital signal processor, which is at the core of many of our digital payloads. Um, we've been since the early 90s with MILSATCOM was the initial development uh, generation one processor. Uh, subsequent to that, there was uh, uh, the dot-com uh, period where there was Soraya from the Middle East, uh, a mobile uh, system, and um, 
ICO and, and Spaceway. So th these had generation processors, two, three, four, and then we had um, uh, WGS, the Wideband Global Satellite System, that uh, took on more uh, higher level processing capabilities. We leveraged uh, that over time with MUOS and, and, and the uh, current Block 2 WGS system and then sold it commercially. And since that time, it, we, we have been sort of disrupting ourselves with technology every two years. Uh, and this is what we need to do and what our customers are demanding. So we couple that digital heart, the core of that technology with phased array technologies and uh, beam steering and the like, and you can virtually change the frequency, change the bandwidth, change the coverage on the ground, move the satellites anywhere and reconstitute to the business plan. So that that's what we're doing in commercial space. And I've got to believe there's some application for uh, the government side there as well. Um, so other things that we're doing in the anti-jam waveform area where we can uh, use them on wideband wide um, platforms in any frequency. Uh, there's spectrum technologies where we are developing uh, the capability to operate very high throughput satellites uh, without a non-interference basis. So uh, that's enabling more systems to coexist. Uh, just to, as important as the technology is we uh, are trying to find ways to use commercial contracting processes uh, with the government side. So I, I feel there's, uh, you know, something we can do to, to uh, simplify the government uh, contracting processes. Um, okay, and, and what, what are the things that we can do to um, leverage our uh, capabilities and, and maybe be able to um, affect some policy changes. One of the biggest uh, issues that we see is just the, uh, the budgetary uh, periods where we believe that the funding uh, should look at longer term commitments. So currently it's an annual budget. Uh, if there could be a commitment for five years or the life of the satellite, it would be extremely uh, helpful for companies like Boeing and other manufacturers who are looking at investments in technologies. Uh, if there's only a, a, an annual commitment, it's hard to make those, those strong investments that require um, capital. Um, we've also heard that um, the reason for the hesitation by the department to enter into the long-term contracts is because the market conditions could change and the rates would fall and they'd be stuck with an asset at or a, a lease um, at a higher, a higher price. But the commercial market has already addressed that. So there's ways to build in contracting um, language to de-risk that type of concern where you would actually adjust the rates based on market conditions. So. Um, uh, the last thing that I think um, I'd like to bring up is the uh, spectrum um, aspect. So spectrum is a scarce resource. The ability to uh, work with the government spectrum and have um, federal government uh, allow commercial users to use that spectrum on a non-interference basis would be helpful for our business. I'll let the rest of the questions uh, come later. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. And next up is um, Marcy Steinke. Uh, she is Senior Vice President of Government Relations at Digital Globe. Uh, and I believe, oh, I believe uh, you have a satellite that's sitting somewhere down in Cape Canaveral about to launch. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that as well. Okay. Thanks. It's got a beautiful ocean view right now. Um, as long as it's above the ocean. Yeah. The, <laughs> indeed. So, um, so I've been with Digital Globe almost five years, but for those that don't know before that, I was uh, in the Air Force on the operational side of things, so kind of a dual perspective here. Uh, the couple of things that I want to address are how the government can better leverage commercial and then also what policy needs uh, changing to make that happen. 
And so just as an overview for you all, uh, there are three things that I want to talk about in the, in the leveraging. And first is um, delivering actionable insights from a multiple source kind of platform. The second is looking beyond acquisition to actual integration. So Mr. Lavero, I concur wholeheartedly. And the third is minimizing barriers. Uh, from a policy perspective, I'll touch on um, both regulatory modernization and responsible space or space traffic management. So uh, we'll start in just a, a few things. Let's talk about uh, deliverable, um, actionable insights. And so uh, for those that don't know, Digital Globe, um, sometimes we get painted as, as the old guy in town and not very flexible. But in fact, we understand that um, you do not exist by pure pixel alone. And so if you look at our plan and what's already in action, we have uh, imagery, platform, and uh, services, which is analytics. And so we believe that that's kind of, I look at it as a three-lane highway to the future. And so to make that happen, you need a number of different things, which, which we are uh, using. First is data. And that data has to be accurate, and it, that accuracy impacts a number of different things, not just the quality of the image, but the usefulness of the analytics that come from that information, that metadata, as well as the actual picture. So um, using that good information gives you better analytics and better services on the back end. Uh, we have right now, we bring in about 70 terabytes of data a day. Uh, we have our future plan for the Constellation will bring in about 120 terabytes of information a day. We have a storage of uh, around 100 petabytes. And so when I tell you that, I'm telling you because we use that for what we're doing um, with that information. Along with that information, you need algorithms. And so, of course, Digital Globe has a great team, and we build algorithms to extract information. But we also believe in using the wisdom of other folks that are building algorithms. So we have a program called Geospatial Big Data, uh, GBDX is what we call it. And it is a platform that's not just our information and the long 15-plus uh, year archive of information, but it's a variety of other sources of information. And so it's an ecosystem that we've built. We have uh, around, I think it's north of, 30 commercial customers as well as some government customers now. So we invite folks to bring in your information, bring in your algorithm, and use our cloud-based platform to get the information you need. Uh, wholly believe that answers is the future, and so that's the direction we're going. We also uh, believe that leveraging clouds, or excuse me, crowdsourcing and automation are key. So we have, in that platform, we've built machine-to-machine um, -machine learning. We're helping narrow um, search spaces so that then you can give that information to the analysts, and they can not spend their time doing. Um, hours and hours and hours of needle or finding the needle in the haystack of needles. And so with that becomes a predictive analytics as well. Uh, just a couple other things I'll mention. Um, when I, we have uh, partnering with uh, Vricon and um, bringing in some really great 3D imagery that goes with it. And a couple of the other things that people may not be aware of, and this is where um, this actually goes to um, there's a number of COCOMs specifically that use this, but we use uh, human landscaping. And it's not just the imagery or the geo or the physical imagery, but it's the cultural information that comes with it. So there is an entire system or a program that's built. And it helps identify not just borders of countries, but tribal borders and tribal alliances and how um, medical or water security fits into different areas. And so a, a number of the different COCOMs use that kind of information. Um, one of the aspects that could be applied in a, in a military environment is uh, if you're going to build a supply line or a supply hub somewhere, taking that information into consideration so you know who you're negotiating with. Maybe you limit the number of tribal leaders um, or, you know, in, in the um, less safe areas, warlords, maybe you avoid building another warlord because you actually have taken all of those things into consideration. A couple things that I think uh, if we look at going beyond acquisition to actual integration, we've uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is really ingrain throughout some of the more um, uh, new capabilities that are out there. And if you take just the schoolhouses and DOD training, 
Um, I think in the schoolhouses, they're still using uh, Iconos imagery in most of the schoolhouses, which, you know, don't, it's a great bird. It's, uh, if it's not 16 years old, it's almost 16 years old. And it's still better quality than the other stuff that's out there right now. But, but there's a lot that has progressed since then. And so having leaders understand what the capabilities are and starting at that ground level and making sure people are aware what's out there. There's a, um, a program we have called Global EGD, and it, anybody with a .mil or .gov address can apply to this. It gets vetted through the government, but it is literally five or six clicks and you're looking at whatever part of the planet you want to look at. It's the most current information. We've um, imaged, downloaded, orthorectified, and had it on a website in 11 minutes. Um, the average is around a couple hours. But if you're one of those guys that's out in a forward operating base and you want to get the most current information, it's not just the most current picture, it's the archive of imagery so you can see the changes as well. So that's out there and, and I'm quite certain that kind of stuff is, it's not being disseminated as well. So we need to work to disseminate that information better. Uh, besides major combatants, we also have used that kind of thing for uh, human humanitarian assistance or um, natural disasters, those kinds of things as well. And then I'll just touch, and we can get into greater detail if you like, but touch on the policy um, changes that would be um, really welcome, Mr. Lovero, if you could get moving. Uh, no surprise to folks that we've been pushing regulatory modernization as well as um, responsible space lately. So that regulatory modernization is, um, it's, it's slow, it's restrictive, it's cumbersome. I know there's a lot of people working on it, but, um, but there is a lot of benefit that would come with, with improvements in that process. Um, the concern with the, the slowness of it, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Rich and I will agree on this one, is that, that that slow and cumbersome process just pushes customers to international competitors. Um, and so we've actually had, we know that they use the cumbersome process of the U.S. government as a reason not to go with U.S. companies at times, so. Um, and then just quickly on uh, space traffic management or responsible space, I think that's a, a conversation that definitely needs to occur. Um, we've been talking about it, I think, for the last year and a half. It's grown, but it's definitely an area that needs to be discussed, and we need, I think there's a number of different areas that we're looking at of, of different altitudes for maneuverable and not maneuverable satellites or making, particularly if you're a university or an eighth grade class, you know, come on into space, let's learn, but let's make um, things trackable so that we minimize the potential for um, space debris. And clearly I think things are gonna need to come down a lot more quickly in 25 years as it stands right now. All right, thank you, Marcy. And our last panelist, uh, Rich Leshner, uh, who is Vice President at uh, Planet, formerly Planet Labs. Has the name change officially taken place? It, it's, a, it's a branding, so okay. we're still Planet Labs, uh, okay. corporate institutionally, but we go by Planet. <laughs> All right, going by Planet. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, Rich, I'll turn it over to you. You're, at a, you're also in the imagery uh, remote sensing part of the space market, but very different than Digital Globe, so I'll allow you to explain. Sure, thank you, and nice to see everybody here today. Uh, it's always challenging to be the last one on a panel with uh, so many insightful and smart people uh, because you wonder what the heck am I supposed to say after everybody else has had such great things to say, but um, I'm going to try maybe to abstract out a little bit, so um, I won't necessarily talk about uh, Planet Lab specifically. We're small satellite commercial remote sensing company. We want high revisit uh, across the globe at medium resolution. Okay, we got that out there. Um, but I think it's interesting. Boeing has been in the space business for, well, I think it was just a little over 50 years. Planet has been in the space business for just a little over five years. Uh, and so what I think you know, you're seeing in industry are companies that range from emerging to established. They're working on space-based platforms that range from small to medium to large. Um, in constellations of single to dozens to hundreds to multiples of hundreds of satellites in many orbital regimes. And what that is doing is creating uh, a diversity of information that's being generated about our planet in near real time that's being fed through the kinds of uh, tools and devices that Marcy mentioned for um, uh, machine learning and algorithm development 
and, and creating, I think, what can reasonably be called an information infrastructure uh, about uh, the habitability uh, and change and sustainability of, of the planet that we're living on. Um, I should mention, in addition to the ways that uh, we see diversity in the space segment, um, there are also in many different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so all of this activity, I think, generates um, an interesting perspective in response to something Scott said, where oftentimes, historically, space policy has been a derivative policy driven by national security or other kinds of civil means. But I think the evolution in what we're seeing here is, is pushing a, a different perspective, which is the commercial space industry is, is now a partner leg of the stool to our inter, you know, of our national space capabilities to national security and civil in a way that's more than just being um, the industrial contractor base, uh, which it had been so capably and so critically for so long. Um, and I think that sort of pushes on the question of what can be done that's sort of new and different and interesting in the area of policy or plans on the government that can take advantage of what you're seeing from space as, as it's uh, from the space companies as they're emerging, right? So you're seeing faster development times, disaggregated systems. Um, you're seeing companies that have planned short orbital lifetimes for their satellites with the intentional uh, deorbit and replenishment capabilities. And you see people intentionally doing um, uh, graceful uh, deorbiting and graceful uh, degradation. So if you have that suite, right, if that's sort of the overview of what you're seeing in industry in all these different categories, before you can get to questions of integration, be it from the data and information side and the insight side, um, or be it from the space side, uh, in terms of thinking about what hardware can do for you in a new kind of way, uh, you have to have a bit of a period of demonstration and exploration. Uh, industry is doing things differently and quickly. Uh, I would say that government military, civil, it sort of doesn't matter, needs to find a way to do rapid demonstrations and get data and information about what capabilities can bring. Uh, that data and information from those demos can uh, inform planning in a new kind of way. Uh, I think we're all used to the historical process of analysis of alternatives and receiving all kinds of information about potential cost and schedule uh, sensitivities around new developments. But if you can complement that with rapid demonstrations uh, on different size platforms from industry that can respond in 12 to 18 months, you can have significantly greater confidence in the decisions and the planning you might make when it comes to uh, how you might choose to flexibly design a future architecture. So would you choose a single point solution? Would you choose a, how, where would you fall in the make by decision? Would you go with a disaggregated network, et cetera? So that experimentation and demonstration period gives you confidence to have a decision about how you want to be flexible, gives you confidence in how quickly or with what kind of speed you can execute either a change in your architecture or an update uh, to your architecture, and gives you speed and confidence in how much of it has to be a series of decisions associated with the satellites or a series of decisions associated with products and services that are derived from satellite and other data that can be uh, provided via cloud services. Uh, and then the last thing it does, I think it gives the folks who are in government positions the idea to play with subtlety, right? So how you choose to go with government only versus a, a more service-based decision for some kinds of things. How you choose to go with dedicated point solutions in a single satellite versus a disaggregated architecture. And how you choose to do those things rapidly in a consistently iterative and demonstration capacity can send signals, as Scott was talking about, uh, associated with which parts of your architecture are the ones that you care most about and might respond most aggressively to, which are the ones where you're willing to tolerate a different kind of risk, uh, which are the ones where you might even be more willing to consider integration from a commercial or international level, as Scott and Doug were both talking. So those are very abstracted points, but I think in terms of the question driving the panel, which is how do we see uh, the government writ large, and the question was specific to you know, the military, it's, I see it by first recognizing that industry is changing with all of the factors that we mentioned, B, choosing to find ways to engage with industry through demonstrations, you know, um, experiments, data buys, and, and figuring it out in real time, and then integrating that into the planning so that your future, archi now, so that your future, archi future architectures are integrated as well. Um, 
because I'll close with this. What we're seeing, Mar Marcy talked a lot about the kinds of things that you can bring to the table. What we're seeing in, in, in the industry is the evolution of just data to information, to insights, to indicators, and then instruments to do something based on the indicators that you receive. That's happening across many market verticals, and it's the same set of trends and movements that's happening inside many government decision making. And so if we're both seeing that, uh, we might have different ends and different objectives in terms of what those <laughs> instruments are, but we might as well find ways to work together smartly on part of that core and part of that process. Thank you, uh, all of the panelists. Uh, great opening uh, remarks. Uh, I think it, we've really uh, set the stage here for a good discussion. Uh, while the audience is getting their, uh, their questions uh, ready, uh, I, I wanted to start, uh, tee off the discussion here um, with Doug. I'll go to you first. Um, you know, from military perspective, if you could reach out into the commercial space industry and direct how they're spending their money. Uh, if you could magically uh, make them invest more or less in certain areas, um, what would you do? Where would you like to see commercial uh, companies putting uh, their investments and where they're going in the future? Well, first of all, let me make sure we understand this is your question because I wouldn't actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but seriously, um, if, um, I think the, the big issue that the government is going to look at as we uh, try to ingest um, commercial space services is cyber vulnerability. Uh, that is the key. Um, you know, we have, we have um, seen um, uh, the much ballyhooed uh, uh, experiments that people are doing in anti-satellite activity uh, across, the, across the globe, uh, but, the, but quite frankly, the soft underbelly of any space system is, is its cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, if we really, and this is not just a military statement, this is a commercial statement as well, uh, because uh, if you're going to depend upon satellite services, um, they are more than many other services dependent upon the security that you can bring to the cyber network that connects to it. Uh, and that's got to be a, a key area where we as the government need to be concerned about. It will be very hard for us to rely on space services fielded through the commercial, uh, through commercial um, uh, practices that don't have good cybersecurity beneath them. And of course, it's very difficult to go ahead and add that on later. That's something that you have to go ahead and address from the get-go. It also tends to be fairly expensive uh, when you do that. So there's this tension <coughs> that is developing. <clears throat> What's interesting is if you're a commercial satellite manufacturer, you may not want to go ahead and guard against an ASAT attack because the likelihood that your satellite gets a sh shot by some sort of a ASAT is quite low. On the other hand, the likelihood that your network gets attacked in a cyber attack is quite high as we see every day. So that is something that both the commercial uh, world and I think the government world um, is, should be concerned with is how do we go ahead and inure our satellite capabilities, our space capabilities, be they commercial, civil, government, entrepreneurial, international, how do we make sure they're defended against a cyber attack? And I think that's the key area that I'd uh, focus on. And Scott, next uh, I'll, I'll go to you. Um, and you know, in your decades of experience uh, in this area, uh, and I know you ha may have had a hand in some previous uh, laws and policies that were enacted here. Um, what has changed fundamentally about the commercial space industry, uh, and what does that mean in terms of updating uh, government laws, regulations, policies? What do you think needs to happen right now? Well, I think uh, one of the things that, that happened is that some of the visions that people had in the, uh, in the Reagan administration, early Bush administration, Bush 41, uh, have come to fruition. That is, there was the thought that if we had more commercial activities in space, that not only would that spur innovation, but it would provide pressure on both the civil and military communities who otherwise would lock into their own ways of being. Uh, they would uh, achieve a detente with each other. Uh, and then not move. Uh, and so the idea of injecting in another innovative force uh, from, the, um, uh, from the private sector was, was certainly something that we thought about uh, back, in the, back in the 80s. Um, one of the things that then happened is in the 90s is that you started to see the integration of space with information technologies. 
Uh, now, from a kind of a nerdy perspective, you can you realize this makes a lot of sense because photons don't weigh anything, and so launch costs, uh, uh, high launch costs, actually give an advantage to moving information. But you saw with the drop of GPS prices as it rolled, you know, you know, rode the rest of commercial IT waves, which you're seeing today in GPS and GIS remote sensing system information fusing together. And even in the threat side, space and cyber uh, have a high degree of overlap, you know, with each other. Uh, so there's been that integration, which has been the change. The other big change uh, has been uh, the rise of private equity finance and, and cyber, excuse me, not cyber, of uh, venture capital uh, financing which in part, and people have debates about this, uh, in part has been uh, driven by uh, the quantitative easing that has been done since the financial crisis, driving interest rates down and people as they search for yield go into higher risk areas. So the private equity and venture capital uh, portion of, of activity has been surprising to me, not because people are interested in space and IT things, but the range and depth that this has gone on uh, in part driven by macroeconomic, you know, conditions as well. So looking uh, forward uh, to the, the future, what uh, might uh, come out of this uh, is that the increasing uh, secular trends in the budget of mandatory spending being what it is and the pressure this is putting on uh, all uh, non-defense discretionary spending. You know, we can argue about variations uh, between this or that, um, view of uh, between a White House or Congress or parties or whatever, of what programs ought to move or not move. But the budget allocations and the budget caps and the overall structure of the federal budget is going to be the grinding pressure point. Uh, it, it is like a glacier coming, coming south, pushing all before it. And so in that environment, uh, the political community is going to find itself dealing with that you know, front and foremost. The operational community on the space side, and I think on the commercial side, are going to be looking for how do they get, you know, the most out of uh, the most out of the limited, increasingly limited amount of resources that they have. This, in turn, is going to drive deeper questions about what should be done in-house, what should be sent out, what intellectual capacities do we need to retain in government, and which which ones are we willing, you know, to let go. Um, and uh, so we can argue about particular uh, projects. The difficulty for the commercial community in responding to that is going to be uh, how realistic they are, or truthful they are with themselves as to where is their new demand coming from and where is it simply government privatization. Uh, so the, some of the, uh, the remote sensing colleagues uh, here, uh, their, their market segment has seen amazing growth in ways that I didn't predict or didn't see back in the, uh, back in the early uh, 90s when we first started high resolution remote sensing. Uh, because in the last decade, what we've seen is location-based services and people like Google and Facebook bringing new demand to the market, not just government demand repurposed, say the way NGA, you know, might be doing and buying commercial or NOAA might be buying commercial, but actual brand new private sector driven demand. So that sector of the space market is a very different kind of beast than say what's happening, I would argue, in launch where the government is still the primary driver of this activity, although there's a lot of new stuff that's potentially coming along. And this, uh, the last uh, question for the uh, three industry panelists, you can answer uh, in whatever order you, you wish. Uh, what do you see, you, several of you hinted at this and, and talked about you know, some changes you'd like to see on the government side um, in contracting and uh, licensing regulations. Um, but you know, what are some specific areas where you think uh, there are some quick wins, uh, especially given that this is a presidential election year, maybe we've got a change in administration coming along. Are there some quick wins for Congress uh, and the, the new administration next year where they could update laws, where they could change practices uh, in a way that would both benefit commercial space industry and also the government? Don't forget your mic. <laughs> we'll tag team this probably. Uh, so I would say actually Congress has, at least certain committees have made great strides in trying to address the issues that are cumbersome and, and weigh upon commercial remote sensing and we are incredibly thankful for that. Uh, there is a path forward and we hope it continues into the new administration and the new Congress. I believe that it will. Uh, 
so some of the things that they're looking at are just the, the regulatory oversight, which uh, probably when it was set up 20 plus years ago made sense. Um, when every satellite was a classified government satellite, but now that the world is different, we need to look at what do they really need to see, oversee, and what can we let go? And so that conversation is ongoing, but I hope that 2017 is the year where the answer comes that there's a lot that can be let go. And, uh, and then we focus on the things that really are, um, one, just uh, monitoring of what the companies are doing so you know, we know much like the FCC oversees co commercial or comm satellites. And, and then, you know, when there is truly a very unique national security implication that, that we don't um, disregard that. Uh, um, I don't have anything specific on that one. I wanted to steal your thunder from earlier when you mentioned space traffic management. Oh, have it. Because um, <clears throat> I do think that's, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question slightly differently to say that um, it's an area where I think uh, uh, we should beware or be, uh, be a little um, uh, cognizant of the potential downsides of trying to go for quick wins, um, looking at space traffic management as an area, because it's really important. There are uh, lots of question, uh, questions unanswered about how um, uh, authorities might be owned for evaluating debris or uh, conjunction or collision risks associated with new emerging large-scale constellations in multiple different orbits. Um, uh, so there's clearly an emerging need, but if one responds a little too quickly, uh, one could bake in a solution that is not quite right and creates more headaches than if if, if one uh, took a little bit of time. And, and so I think one of the things that the government has a, a great power to do um, before it can choose to regulate or before it can choose to do uh, any kind of oversight function is to have a bit of a convening function and, and stand there with the warning that, that some folks are afraid of that often says, hey, if, if we don't see uh, certain things evolve, we might have to step in and start to regulate, but in, in exert that convening function and then with it say, what can you industry do to establish some of your own ideas for rules of the road or norms of behavior that are relevant to the issues that we're going to be facing with traffic management, situational awareness, and orbital debris that could um, alleviate the pressure a little bit to move on the legal or regulatory front, but doesn't take away uh, the time and the sense of urgency for people to act and make smart decisions. I, I would agree with the um, with the uh, debris mitigation. We, we'd be happy to participate in, in something like that, that forum like that. And also, um, we're we're looking for I think more lease models, something in acquisition, something to get um, get some of these uh, things moving. Uh, we we feel the acquisition process is long and protracted and and leasing should be simpler and doable in some cases um, also regulatory wise I, I still um, not to give away satellite spectrum space spectrum to preserve it for satellite not give it to terrestrial would be extremely helpful <laughs> Scott, did you have a point? Um, in, in terms of uh, things that for Congress to uh, things to suggest uh, one of them, uh, going back to Doug's point about uh, IT uh, security and so forth, uh, this administration has put uh, funding in for space defense and resilience uh, activities, uh, which I think has been a very uh, positive development, and I think the next administration will be well advised to uh, continue uh, some of that work uh, because a lot, lot more needs to be done. Uh, the second thing I would say regarding uh, regulations, uh, there is this large issue of mega constellations that uh, Richard referred to. Um, I've been participating in some UN discussions on long-term sustainability of space activities, and uh, 12 of 16 guidelines eventually reached consensus this last June. And uh, you know, sometimes you know the UN activities is like watching paint dry uh, as, as it works its way through. But when it, something comes out that actually has consensus and gets out, it's fairly powerful. And some of the about half of the regulation of uh, the guidelines that did come out 
uh, they dealt with regulatory issues. And again, uh, I was reminded of this because of Richard's comment about a convening function. Some of the regulatory guidelines sound really zero authority, but the fact that you got consensus on them I think was amazing. If you're going to regulate, please talk to the industry you're going to regulate. Uh, please talk to the other ministries that might be involved in doing this. Uh, think about cost benefit. Uh, this stuff sounds, I mean, I mean, really basic, but getting other countries to kind of buy in and go, yeah, that's something we need to do is particularly important for space uh, because uh, any, any one bad actor can, can make things uh, really harmful. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, com commercial remote sensing regulation was already touched on, but I want to get back to sort of the, uh, the spectrum issue. Um, spectrum is massively important not only for the space community but for many developing countries because they don't have access to space, they, they really don't have even their own infrastructure. Um, and there is a split, as many people in this room know, between the FCC, which responds to itself as an independent commission, um, and everybody else in the agencies who respond to the executive branch. And so you have a separation of powers issue going on there between FCC and the agencies which makes getting both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue synced up on spectrum to be especially hard. There is a lot of money that is running around in things like terrestrial mobile broadband. Uh, and that pressure of that amount of money is immense. And so space provides very unique capabilities that I think aren't always recognized or realized uh, by the commission and when it, when it makes these decisions. Um, and so not just satellite spectrum, but GPS, weather, environmental, these are all things, if they were missing, it would be just as devastating as if we were actually attacked by a foreign enemy. So making sure that doesn't mess up uh, is also something that I think the Congress as a whole will want to watch. Each of the major committees with an interest in space are all gonna, also going to watch the spectrum issue because it touches their abilities. All right. And with that, I'll uh, open it up for questions from the audience. I think we have a microphone. We have a microphone in the back here. Um, so I'm going to go to this gentleman here on the aisle. I was just wondering, a uh, question for Dasty Lavero. You mentioned the need to leverage commercial capabilities for national security purposes. Do you see any role for our allies and partners in terms of capabilities or technologies or platforms that could or should be leveraged for national security? Sure. Thanks very much. Yeah. Normally, uh, my uh, my stump speech on this includes uh, both commercial and international. Since this was mostly about a commercial um, uh, discussion today, I, I uh, left it to that. But absolutely, um, there. <clears throat> you know, if you look at most of the spacefaring nations on the planet, um, most of them tend to be partners or allies of the United States. Obviously, two exceptions to that uh, to that exist, but the rest of them happen to be uh, pretty good allies of the U.S. And most of them uh, do want to partner with the U.S. Uh, Scott was talking about the International Space Station earlier. We have a bunch of partners in civil space. We also have many partners in military space, uh, quite frankly. Uh, in fact, we, um, we began a, a formal uh, instantiation of that about uh, four years ago, five years ago, called the uh, Con Combined Space Operations Initiative, the CSPO Initiative, uh, which, uh, which has, includes five of our allies right now. Uh, and we'll probably expand to more in the in the future. <clears throat> We've been playing war games with our allies. Uh, we just finished up one in Germany with seven different nations uh, recently. Uh, every one of these nations again brings um, brings their own robust, um, capable uh, systems to to the fore. I always like to uh, try to remind people that some of the most protected communications on the planet's uh, not in, in the X band. Um, uh, for spectrum uh, belong to our allies in UK and France as opposed to in the US. Uh, so there are incredible capabilities out there uh, in all mission areas, whether that be uh, in the position navigation and timing mission area, in the imaging mission area, in the satellite communications mission area, space situational awareness mission area, and every other mission area you can think of. Uh, there are capabilities that our allies bring <clears throat> that uh, can easily be shared and easily be incorporated we have not thought about doing that in the past, and that needs to change. It has been our habit to go ahead and use just U.S. space capabilities, and that makes no sense at all in both the fiscal environment that Scott talked about and in the, um, and in the threat environment that I talked about. It makes no sense not to go ahead and marry our capabilities with those of our allies, so 100 percent we are looking at that. Right. Down the front here, if we could bring a... Microphone. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Pat Host with Defense Daily. I have a question for Mr. Lavero. Uh, General Hyten has talked about how he sees a role for reusable rocketry uh, for military use. Um, unfortunately, it seems like the Air Force's range are stuck in, in a 20th century mindset where they only launch every few months or so and it's an, an, an expendable vehicle. I wonder if you see that as a problem and what perhaps you're doing to nudge the Air Force forward to more responsive and innovative range practices to take advantage of those reusable rocket technologies. Sure, thanks, Pat. Um, so I don't know that I would call it a problem. I would call it a condition uh, that we have right now. And that condition is predicated upon the fact that we haven't found a economic use in military space yet for responsive reusable launch. Um, I often view launch um, as the most exciting, but quite frankly, um, the most boring part of any space mission. Um, it's exciting for those of you who have sat at a launch pad like I and General Armour and others have, and, and, and Marcy who's sitting there right now. Um, it's at a very exciting time. Um, that excitement sometimes tells us that the most, that's the most important part of the space mission. It's not. Uh, that is a trucking operation, quite frankly. It's a very, very high horsepower truck um, to get things into, into orbit. Uh, what we care about is what we're bringing to orbit, and if what we're bringing to orbit, back to Rich's point, if you want to go ahead and be able to replenish small con con large constellations of small satellites with evolved capability constantly, you need that kind of capability. So I, I view that we have a condition of launch that exists today that reflect the space architectures that we have. We don't have a condition of launch today that reflects the fact that we can't do something. It's that we don't need to do something. The minute we need to do it, and we might need to do it either commercially, we might need to do it militarily, the minute we need to do something, I'm fully confident that the uh, kind of creativity that we've seen already in launch, quite frankly, with uh, the likes of uh, SpaceX and Rocket Labs and, um, and Orbital ATK and everybody else who's in this, uh, who's in this ever increasing uh, market. I think the solutions will be brought to bear. Uh, I am uh, I'm far less worried about how we'll launch respond to our next architectural needs than how will our architectures evolve to meet our military needs. Uh, and I think that, um, that the launch capabilities will get there. And if they don't get there on a federally funded Air Force base, they'll get there on the state funded launch, uh, launch base, which is quite frankly uh, the way airports compete. Uh, and I think that's a much better model than the way that we compete on launch heads today. So I, I want to send the, the same question down the row here and see if any of the other panelists uh, would like to respond, and particularly looking at how uh, the advances that we are seeing in the launch market. Um, reusability is you know, really a means to an end. The end, uh, the objective we're going after here is higher launch rates, uh, more responsive launch, and lower cost launch. Um, would any of you like to comment on how that affects your businesses and the types of capabilities uh, that become economically viable? Well, in the commercial satellite business, a low-cost launcher is uh, imperative. Uh, I, I think that reusability is attractive to our customers uh, for capturing the low cost, and, and uh, SpaceX and others are you know, working on that. And so um, I think that's good. And as, as far as constellations go, like was mentioned, I think it's an imperative. Um, so I, I would say, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you know, you say reusable, but I think part of what you might also be thinking about there when, when that's discussed is responsive or, or readily available uh, or some combination of, of responsive and readily available. And I think whether you're in, in the small sat world or traditional, you know, what you care about is the opportunity to have a bit of predictability in your schedule, the idea, the opportunity to control where you go in terms of orbit, when you go. Um, and to be able to do that in a cost environment uh, that's affordable. And uh, right now the smaller set community has to mostly be secondary payloads and uh, be opportunistic uh, in, in getting rides, particularly if it's to orbits that are of the greatest utility. I do think that some of the companies that uh, Doug mentioned and, and the way that you're seeing uh, the evolution of a, of a smaller satellite launch capability um, that has these advantages of being uh, you know, responsive, potentially reusable in parts, uh, flexible for scheduling and so forth, will only further enable um, more of the satellite architecture based on those uh, satellite 
satellites or satellite architectures that can utilize that kind of launch capability. So there is a feedback mechanism between the two. The only other thing I'd add is that um, clearly uh, how we've launched in the past is not necessarily how we will launch in the future, and you absolutely have to physically look at all options there. So we'll be looking at a lot of the different options as we go forward. Yeah, let me, uh, let me add one more thing because I think Rich hit on an important point that I didn't mention. There is a feedback loop. Uh, between uh, between uh, how we launch and how we build systems, right? If if every launch is a, is a hundred million dollars, or and that would be a cheap launch today, quite frankly, uh, if every launch is couple is several hundred million dollars, um, then you tend to maximize the ability the the capability on any system, and you make those systems last longer and longer. Um, the, if launch is cheaper, you may change the kind of system. So there is a feedback loop, and it is a question. I always view it, because I'm a satellite guy, I view it from the satellite end of things, but there are people who are launch people as well, uh, and they view it from the launch ends of things, and I think that neither end is the correct end. Um, you have to go ahead and view it from both ends, and there will be an evolution along, along, that, uh, uh, along both sides. Uh, as we see cheaper satellite manufacturing, then you're going to see a strive for cheaper launch to match that cheaper satellite. Um, you're not going to launch a $500,000 satellite on a $100 million launcher. That does not make any sense. Uh, so there's an interesting there's an interesting feedback uh, that will that we're seeing on both ends of that spectrum, that the government will take advantage of on both ends of that spectrum. Uh, I'm Toby Harshaw from Bloomberg View. Um, this is for Doug initially and then for anyone else who wants to dive in. Uh, a number of the people in this room were at an event this morning with the uh, three service secretaries. Um, and they were unsurprisingly asked, um, what is the most pressing military issue for the next president? Um, but I was surprised when Air Force Secretary James said uh, space policy. She said that over the next four years, there are a number of monumental decisions that need to be made. She did not get into any details. Um, do you want to say, without reading her mind, what she had in mind? Um, and particularly things that may have in, involved industry as well as just the government. Sure, thanks. Let's see, that's the uh, second time in about four days that I've been asked to read a secretary's mind. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, Secretary James obviously is, uh, is the uh, principal DOD space advisor, um, uh, the pity for space, as she likes to call it. Uh, and so certainly space is on her mind. I have not talked to her about what are the most pressing uh, policy um, issues that, uh, that she sees, and, and thank you for advising. I probably will go talk to her about that. Um, <clears throat> but I do, I, do, I do think, you know, if I look, if I look at them um, from, from my perspective, and I haven't spoken much about policy here today. I've spoken more about capability, so let me talk a little bit about policy. We've talked about them, uh, them um, somewhat already. Uh, regulatory reform or regulatory relaxation is clearly something that we need to go ahead and deal with. And I, and I say regulatory relaxation when I'm only looking at one portion of the, of the uh, regulatory environment, which is how we regulate currently remote sensing capabilities. We also need um, new regulations in areas we don't have any regulation today, um, as, uh, as Rich talked about, for space traffic management. So I think there's a regulatory agenda about how will the government regulate space capabilities for the good of all, not just for the good of all America, but for the good of all, of all world, of all nations, as Scott uh, talked about. How will we go ahead and regulate to that to advantage? How we will we make sure that regulation doesn't disadvantage either our companies or our activities? I think that's a key question. I don't believe anybody knows the answer to that question, but I think that's a key question. So that's number one. Um, number two is um, really, the ability of the, and this is now a Defense Department question, how do we go ahead and integrate non-U.S. government owned and controlled space services into our U.S. government missions? Let me give you an example. If we drop a GPS guided bomb, but we guide it from a Galileo system and it hits the wrong target, um, what does that, who, whose liability is that? How have we gone ahead and accepted liability for a Galileo signal versus for a GPS signal. We control GPS, we can bring lethal force to bear today on a target because we can trust GPS guidance to the extent that we own it. Can we trust non-US government regulated and owned systems to go ahead and bring lethal force to bear? 
Um, by the way, we do that in telecommunications, we do that in shipping, we do that in a whole bunch of other areas, but we've never done it in space, and we have to go ahead and think about how do we do that kind of activity. And the third policy issue that I would uh, talk about just to, just to um, complete the triplet is indemnification. How do we, if we're going to use commercial capabilities and foreign capabilities, how do we go ahead and indemnify and or extend indemnification to protect those capabilities? What is the U.S. government role in indemnifying that use and protecting that use? We would have no policy on that today. Um, we can extend policy we have in the terrestrial realm to that, but that has not been done yet. And so we would need to think about that. Some of that is statutory in nature. Some of that is simply policy in nature, and I think we've got to go ahead and attack uh, those things. So those are three uh, things that I'll throw out there, and I will go talk to Secretary James and find out what was in there, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to attempt to, to read the Secretary's uh, mind uh, on this, and, uh, and so Doug will, will report back uh, as to what was there. Um, but I find some of the, the comments a little, a little mysterious because I think we have plenty of policy. Uh, there may be questions about how to apply it and so forth, but I don't see a large vacuum, at, certainly at a national policy level. So I'm not sure exactly what she's talking about. The things that I would see um, as being important is really about all about execution and implementation. Things that are really tough are things like the GPS OCX, <coughs> the recent, you know, nunn McCurdy, you know, breach kind of things. Uh, how one goes about affording some of the space launch, recapitalization of the uh, space architectures. How do we move toward more of a warfighting uh, operation the way General Hyten uh, has talked about to deal with these sort of real threats, uh, putting that culture uh, in there? Every time that uh, DOD, or to be fair, the scientific community has been asked to sacrifice performance for cost, they've gone for performance. Okay, in the commercial side, you can see people maybe going for, going for saving cost, but the military and scientific community's history has always been to uh, go for that extra performance. So managing implementation uh, is probably the most driving issue, I think, for the national security community. Areas where there might be some, some overlap um, or areas that maybe would come up as policy, uh, first of all, regulations for new and emerging innovative uh, activities. I think that's, uh, that's certainly true. And what I find striking is that we don't hear the phrase Department of Commerce mentioned very much. Now, I, I'm an ex-member of the Department of Commerce. My old office is, is there. I have warm feelings for it. But um, in all these sorts of discussions, we haven't regularized commercial space. We don't see that NOAA uh, plays its role in commercial remote sensing. But a lot of these commercial issues, strangely enough, are being dealt with by the State Department, or they're being dealt with by the Transportation Department, or they're being asked about with DOD. Uh, maybe that's just an accident, but it seems to me that more, more hands could be put on the oars. The other area that I think DOD does need to think about more, along with state and others, is the application of law of armed conflict as applies to space. Um, I went through a bit of an exercise uh, over the last few years, along with this long-term sustainability stuff, with an international space code of conduct. And uh, the Russians were largely opposed uh, to such a code, in part because sections of it dealt with use of force in space. I didn't agree with the Russian positions and, and obstructionism, but I think they had a point uh, in working through some of the uh, sometimes uh, very complex scenarios that arise in the use of force in space. Now, fortunately, we don't have a lot of experience with the use of force in space. That's a good thing, but also means there's a lot of uncertainties there. So uh, from an academic standpoint, law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, how it applies, the liability indemnification questions that uh, Doug was mentioning. Uh, those are things that I think actually the, uh, somewhat sent the academic community uh, and uh, other researchers should be paying more attention to so they can get to a point where they can be, may be made into a policy choice for somebody at Secretary James's level. Uh, and so I, I want to go down the road here to the industry folks. Um, from your perspective, especially picking up on Doug's comments uh, on uh, changing the licensing process, or potentially changing licensing process for commercial remote sensing, uh, but also this issue of use of force in space and indemnification uh, of, of uh, commercial operators. It, you know, if your systems are being used by DOD uh, for warfighting purposes, even if it's indirectly, 
Um, you know, uh, how do, how do, how's the industry viewing this? How are your insurers viewing this? Uh, and, you know, picking up on the licensing part, what specifically could be changed uh, with the current licensing process for commercial remote sensing? So here I will speak specifically for Digital Globe. We are proud of our partnership with the U.S. government, and we understand that you know, we'll see what happens down the road. It's not something we take lightly, and it's obviously a point of discussion, but um, that's a, a partnership that the company um, clearly wants to continue and is proud of. So um, it, it's part of the mix, and I'll leave it there. As far as the regulatory licensing, um, I, I hope that the next Secretary of Commerce, and it's a good point, um, it follows in the so footsteps of Secretary Pritzker and really embraces that leadership position that they have. Um, they are the lead for the decisions with inputs from others, and so hopefully there'll be a, a real um, understanding that you, you know pushing the time frames that stay somewhere near the regulatory time frames and and those kinds of things. I hope there's a, a greater or a great embrace of that. Is it time that we move to a, a regulatory licensing process that where there's a presumption of yes that you will be approved if you've been a, if a license has been granted for something similar in the past should it be a presumption within 90 days We'd, you are approved? I feel like I just handed you this question. So we actually <laughs> we actually have been pushing for a, a real change in the whole mantra of a yes and less. Um, right now it's incumbent upon industry to actually prove why we should be able to do something. Uh, there are a lot of times when we are pointing out to folks that, you know, it, it actually is happening in this country on their website. So why are you restricting us from it? And, you know, it needs to be a conversation as we go forward and we understand that. But it, in, the, in the shift of things, going from completely classified and a very aerospace-centric concept to where we are now, where there are so many commercial implications and the world is a different place than it was when these when these regulations were put into place. It's it's time for that shift. We wholeheartedly agree. Um, I, I think it's there's a, a fundamental uh, assumption that's made in the question of should you move to the assumption of a yes subject to some compelling reason to say no, which is that um, there ought to be or there ought to remain in place the kind of process associated with doing licensing that exists now. Um, and what I would say is it's worth challenging the assumption. So I'm going to bring this back to the original question to get to this point, which is um, I, I certainly have, don't know what was in the Secretary's mind, and, and there are ways in which policy can be kind of fractal, so there might be a series of very specific DOD kinds of questions that they need to get to along the lines of what Doug was talking about, even if at the national level the framework is roughly correct and there's a couple of big picture questions that you need to take some swings at, and the regulatory environment might be one of them, space situational awareness might be one of them, but overall the, the framework is still right. Um, the other question, though, is to take a pause and to say, okay, the framework is still right because we think certain sorts of fundamental assumptions we've made are still true. And in the case of the specific application of that assumption with respect to commercial remote sensing, there is the fundamental assumption that uh, there should be this interagency review process for national security concerns and everything else. And it's, it's worth, in a discussion environment like this, to ask the fundamental question, well, what if there was simply a regulatory regime that verified that practices were not uh, incompatible with our international obligations and then otherwise licensed this activity in a way to allow it to be um, free market based and, and commerce based in the same way that lots of other digital information markets are. Um, whether they're internet based, social media based, etc. There are uh, digital information markets and services that have no or little to no regulatory touch because they never came from space, they never came from this government-only environment. Space sort of stays there because of this historical precedence that it came from the government, but maybe the time for that fundamental assumption has come for a review and therefore the regulatory environment should change as well. 
Well, that's a, a good point you raised. I should, uh, full disclosure, several of us are on this NOAA Advisory Committee for Commercial Remote Sensing, so we have, in fact, discussed this before. Um, so I, I am pointedly asking questions. But you, you raise a great point, Rich. Uh, if Twitter and Facebook had been subject to interagency review, would they have ever been approved? Um, probably not, uh, I, would, I would guess, or at least delayed by many years. Uh, so, Doug, I'm going to throw this back to you and put you on the spot here. Uh, what do you think? Uh, are, would you be okay with a licensing regime where there's not necessarily an interagency review process? Um, so, um, in the uh, in the best uh, um, in, in in the best uh, resemblance of a political candidate, let me skirt your issue, um, and. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> and, 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 and answer it with a, with a, um, a theoretical uh, problem, and then you may be able to figure out where I stand on this. It, it, struck, me, um, it struck me when Dawn was speaking that um, she talked about SynCon satellite uh, launched in 1963. Uh, you know, we didn't, have a, uh, we didn't have a regulatory review process for that satellite, and as a result, no satellite communication service is subject to a national security review. It's subject to a frequency review, but not a national security review, and I would posit that, um, that as great a threat as remote sensing might be to U.S. forces or to U.S. national security, um, people have used satellite communications, um, even U.S. supplied satellite communications for means for capabilities nefarious to the U.S. Uh, national interest. And yet we don't subject uh, communications to, uh, to national security review because we're not used to doing that. We never did it. It's not how it developed. We developed remote sensing law and licensing practice because it, it was sprang from a government-owned capability, really, that then became a commercial capability uh, following the Landsat Act. Uh, and so we, we viewed it through a different lens. And I have to wonder if that lens is the correct lens because, as Rich says, um, we, don't, uh, we don't apply that lens to any other kind of commercial activities uh, in general. There are some structures of ITAR and Missile, um, missile technology control uh, regulation and those kind of things, which we do have, uh, and, and some of those work well and some of those less well, uh, but there is a different process for those that actually speeds things through the system. Um, I, I wonder if we don't need to relook at this whole, uh, this whole area, and I think that is something that the uh, next administration needs to deal with, is that do, have we been treating space in ways that are different than what we treat every other um, domain in terms of how we allow commercial activity to proceed uh, and should we therefore change how we view space. Okay. Well, as one of the people who was guilty for writing the section of the 92 <laughs> uh, Act, uh, I couldn't get away with CINCOM, uh, you know, precedent back in, back in the day. Um, so it was, it was necessary. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the things which are different uh, today uh, is globalization, uh, unmanned air vehicles, uh, the blending of GIS and other information technologies, all these things which we didn't have in mind uh, in the early 90s. So in the early 90s when we first constructed this licensing regime, I would have been thrilled if there were two competitive commercial companies in the market. Uh, that would have been great. Uh, but a whole bunch of other things have happened uh, since then. And you're right, we subject to, we subject to these past historical images and uh, filters, which we don't really do to other things. The place to fix that, I would argue, is actually in legislation. Uh, we could work around the, the, the 960 regulations. We could work around, uh, you know, the uh, national policy directives and so forth and write them in different ways. But the fundamental foundation of the licensing regime is in law. Now, one should always be careful in messing with law because you, you're sure, not sure about unintended consequences, so the point's about consulting. Um, but this is one of those areas where we, we mentioned what the next administration wants to deal with. I would say this is something the next Congress needs to deal with and, you know, consult with and talk with the administration and industry and so forth. But more and more uh, in, these, in these areas, I think the Congress is going to play a larger and more important role in the next decade than it has in the past. Now, this is odd for a space policy person because I normally look to the executive branch since Eisenhower and Kennedy as driving that. Uh, but if I look at things that have happened in space exploration, as I look at th the debates over satellite systems, as I look on remote sensing, 
really the Congress, uh, believe it or not, is, is probably going to be play this larger role. Now, it's somewhat like the jokes, you know, congressional leadership is like military intelligence, you know, it's one of those, you know, party jokes people make, but, it, but it's not a joke. And, and I think that remote sensing, uh, which was an area that the, the Congress led on in 1992, is an area that I think Congress can and should lead on because this is not fixable solely within the prerogative administration. All right, and, and unfortunately, we've run out of time here. I know we had many other questions in the audience. Uh, I, I suppose we'll have to do this again. Uh, I want to thank all of uh, the panelists for joining us uh, today and thank all of you.